uh, which is from the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 1 through 12. Pharisees and the Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He answered them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be storm day, for the sky is red, threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. When the disciples reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. Jesus said to them, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they began to discuss it among themselves, saying, we brought no bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, O oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive? Do you, do you not remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone, um, both uh, to friends here at 826 Eglinton and anyone joining us online. And especially if we have any uh, newcomers or people seeking and investigating Jesus Christ, uh, be it online or here at 826, um, we certainly welcome you. Uh, we believe uh, the church, above all, is, is the one true organism slash organization, just life, you know, living body that uh, does sincerely seek for the benefit of the outsider as well, uh, as much as, um, yeah, we, we find and experience Christ's benefits inside. Uh, faith in him and as the church. So we are continuing uh, through our series in Matthew. Um, can't remember if I said it or not. Um, my name is Albert, so I want to welcome you. And uh, I do want to talk about the idea that it's just a thought, uh, but it could change your life. And just borrowing that from a little booklet uh, by John Maxwell, that title. But uh, hopefully you'll see by the end of the message um, what we mean by this little thought. Uh, I want to begin by just, uh, you know, hitting a headline. Uh, as most of you are probably aware, recently Ontario um, introduced a new color code system uh, to have us uh, just aware of where we're at with COVID. And right now we're in the red zone. Uh, and for me, at least, uh, the color coding is helpful. Uh, maybe it's because I've been ingrained growing up with traffic lights you know, green for go, yellow for being careful, cautious, red for stop. Um, and, and red certainly has that notion of, you know, warning. Now I start this way because I just want you to realize that even Jesus, uh, he didn't have an explicit color code system, but certainly in his teaching, uh, at times he gives warnings. And today, if you caught it, he says, beware. And in him saying, beware, there's some spirit of warning and caution. So certainly in the Christian life, there are green zones, yellow zones, red zones. Uh, and so I hope today, by the time we work through the passage, that something will be stirring in your heart to want to continue journeying by faith, relating to God by faith, that there will be something in your heart that wants to talk to God in a, with, a heart behind, with the heart behind these words. Lord, help me to beware of spiritual pitfalls. Uh, certainly, um, at the end of the day, we want to be pulled toward God and, and a life of uh, Christian discipleship by the beauty of Christ, by something good and redeeming and true. But even we see in the teaching of Jesus and how he raised his disciples that there is a place for healthy warning. Certainly, God is not wanting followers just out of fear of condemnation, uh, but certainly there's a healthy place for a healthy dose of warning. And so the first uh, warning or, or 
thing that we should be aware of, just getting right into it, is to be aware of an adulterous heart. Now, I know that's intense. Those words are intense. But I am just taking from Jesus' words here and, and what he says. Uh, jumping to verse 4, um, he diagnoses uh, these religious political leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. If you're not familiar with them, basically think of them as the religious political leaders of the people of Israel at the time, a little sub-government under the overarching government of Rome. And they were polar opposites. We'll get into a little bit more of their differences later, but generally speaking, you can think of, if you think of a political religious spectrum, uh, the, the Pharisees were generally more on the right, uh, more conservative, uh, and the Sadducees were more on the left, more liberal. Uh, but they uh, were so moved by, um, you know, against Jesus together that they could overlook their differences and send a coalition to test Jesus together. Uh, and, and, you know, just as a side note, they governed their version of the House of Commons, if you will, was called the Sanhedrin. And so uh, you picture two groups coming together and they had something in common, their angst towards Jesus and the movement that he was uh, stirring up and that was competing with uh, devotion to their own platforms. Now Jesus, he assesses them in this little exchange. He diagnoses them. Jesus doesn't mince words and he calls them out, you evil and adulterous generation. You seek for a sign. And here, therefore, we need to beware, if, if Jesus is calling them out, calling them to have adulterous hearts, what does that mean for you and me? Now, what does Jesus mean by an adulterous generation? Well, let's think just first of literal adultery, the way we most commonly understand it. If there is a, a married couple and one uh, person, all of a sudden, they, their, their original commitment to their original love, they're, they're being tempted to cheat, and be, they're being drawn towards some other illicit love. That, that's the heart of adultery. Cheating on their original commitment, a heart that is toying with the idea of leaving the one that you loved and made a commitment to. And oftentimes, uh, it's for some sensual reason. They want more excitement outside of that original commitment. Uh, or, uh, or, and oftentimes, the characteristic that accompanies adultery is they're looking for any little sign to justify their cheating. And oftentimes, sadly, they put the onus on their spouse to prove their love for them. And really, it's with ulterior motive, though, uh, to find the smallest excuse not to stay because your love is not proving itself enough. Now, Jesus, he takes that heart, that adulterous heart, and applies it to man's relationship with God. And so we can have an adulterous heart toward God. See, God was our original love. God is humanity's first love. God created us, and he created us out of love. And there was a wonderful relationship. He made a commitment to us. And we know that Adam and Eve are spiritual, and I believe even our literal flesh and blood, all of us are our ancestor. They cheated on God. They broke uh, just faith with God. And so this is what Jesus means, that here are these people, and the, the heart of the, uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees, you should just combine them together and call them Sadducees, but um, uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees, uh, they had this heart that uh, underneath it all, they were just looking for another reason to follow their own ways and to leave the God, the, the way that God was calling them to follow him. And their heart, their action, now we go back to verse 1, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they came to test, to test. As if they had some moral superiority, that they were on some higher ground than God, and that God was in the position to prove himself to them. And they approached Jesus this way as representing God. Prove that you are from God. Now this word test, it's the same exact word that Jesus uses to uh, refute Satan when he's being tempted in the wilderness. When Jesus says in Matthew 4, 
Jesus says to Satan, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You shall not try to uh, put God in a corner, force him in a corner to prove himself as if he owed you any proof, as if you are on some superior, higher ground than him. And what is described as Satan himself, his action in tempting, it's the same word here, test. So let's pause and first look in the mirror. Scripture is one way it's meant to play a role in our lives. It's meant to be a mirror for our hearts, our motives. Am I testing God at all in this season of life? Am I testing God? Am I asking him to prove himself to me in a self-serving manner, in a doubting manner, this is important to ask ourselves and be honest about because testing, ultimately, it reveals a lack of trust. And the Christian faith, following Jesus at the heart of it, is meant to be a forsaking all I trust him. When, when I just look at my own parenting and, and when there are times when I don't trust my kids, I'm testing them a lot. And so testing usually points to a lack of trust. But the converse is true as well. When there is a deep trust, it's easy not to want to test. And you even intentionally, if you intentionally choose to trust a relationship, then you intentionally avoid testing. Now, Jesus goes on, observe with me in verse 2, he goes on to describe uh, the condition of their hearts. And he, he gives... He makes this point in verse 2. He answered them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. The commentators all affirm that this was a uh, known way to predict weather during the first century. Uh, And so Jesus is saying, you have become experts, since you're asking for a sign from heaven, You're experts at looking at signs concretely in the sky and being able to predict the weather. But in pointing this out, Jesus is saying you're so expert at uh, just commanding nature and, and getting a read on things in concrete circumstances. But Jesus is pointing out their hypocrisy and inconsistency of their heart that they are asking while they can, just an irony, that while they can have this command over nature and predict that they can't see the signs of God. Now, you and I, when we think of just humanity over um, just the thousands of years, certainly we've, we've become really good at predicting the weather. We have satellites in the sky that can see all the clouds moving and Doppler radars and so forth. There are thousands of uh, just billion-dollar satellites all over the world that are all pointed out towards outer space and just longing to find one small communication from extraterrestrial life. We've become so good as a culture, as a civilization, in predicting the rise and fall of stock markets, of the dollar, of interest rates. And we even put a lot of energy into predicting certain trends like fashion or real estate, social trends, government trends, et cetera, et cetera. And, but we fall short of being able to recognize the signs of God working in history. And so when Jesus says, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times, that's Jesus in his way saying, you don't recognize how God is actually working in history. The irony, the sad irony is that you you are expert at being able to interpret what's right in front of you, the concrete, the skies. But as you ask for a sign from heaven, you're failing to recognize Jesus speaking himself that I am the sign from heaven. Now second then, uh, we need to beware of earthly cares. First, we need to be aware of an adulterous heart, meaning looking for any reason to just go and live life the way we want it apart from God and to leave uh, God and and our relationship with him as uh, he has uh, ordained it to be. 
But related to that is uh, just this need to beware of earthly cares. Now, where do we see this? Picking up in verse 5, uh, Jesus has this exchange, and then they crossed over to another part of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and when the disciples reached the other, just picking up reading now, the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. Now remember the miracle that has just happened, feeding of the 4,000 and seven basket loaves uh, left over, right? And, and they forgot to bring any bread from that surplus. Now just imagine, I, I think there's supposed to be some, I don't know, either comedy or just comfort and relatability. But you just imagine how that went on, right? And, and Jesus has just performed this, this grand miracle. They've rode and they're hungry. They've burnt calories. And of course, they just want a recovery drink or some meal to just replenish their energy. And then one of them, you know, it's like it was his job to bring the bread. And he forgets from those seven baskets full. It's like, I, I thought you were supposed to bring it. I thought you were supposed to bring it. And they're hungry, and they're fixated on this. And Jesus sees this as a teachable moment. Watch, and he just now throws out there, watch and beware of the leaven or the yeast. And this is a baking. We're to understand this in terms of baking. Watch and beware of the, the leaven or the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And the disciples just fixated on the lack of bread, perhaps their hunger. And they realize they forgot the bread. There's no bread. And Jesus now speaks of something related to bread. In verse 7, and they began discussing it among themselves, saying, but we brought no bread. And we see here the disciples taking Jesus 100% literally, concretely literally, and they're confused. Why is he saying that we need to be aware of the bread of the Pharisees and the yeast of the Pharisees when we brought no bread? Now, on the one hand, this makes the disciples more relatable. Because if we're honest, even myself, a lot of times, uh, we're, we're very simple and we are really just fixated on what's right in front of us, the concrete, the literal. But what we see a picture of here is, is the disciples' earthly cares, and in that sense, they're relatable. But they're also a bit of a sore example for us. Now, our, our earthly cares, certainly, on one level, it can just reveal our simpleness. I don't blame these disciples. Rowing, they forgot food, they're hungry. And so they completely misinterpret what Jesus is saying because they are, their, their stomachs are just fixated on being filled. And so there's just a sort of simple nature to all of us. And who can blame someone for being hungry? But perhaps on a bit of a deeper level, there, there's an all-consuming idolatry here. The fact that they are taking Jesus and what he just said and interpreting it completely on an earthly level. And I think also here there's an ultimately naive short-sightedness. Not be able to see beyond the, the, just what's right in front of them and or what's not in front of them, the lack of bread, and not trying to understand what Jesus is trying to teach more deeply here. So let me ask, what earthly care are you consumed by? What earthly care distracts you from heaven's comfort? What, what earthly care are you so fixated on? And, and it's, it's very tempting to be completely consumed by earthly cares in the middle of a pandemic. Even in my own social circles, I've seen sides of my friends' character and personalities come out that I never knew were there. And just being in the midst of a pandemic and all the anxiety and whatnot that it can surface. It's like, wow, I never knew that was there or that you could be like that. But certainly these earthly cares bring all these things up. 
and we miss the greater lesson, the greater comfort that Jesus wants in our life. And so that's why he says, O you of little faith, why are you discussing amongst yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Jesus, again, just calling it out as is. You're focused on just what, by fact, just what's right in front of you. When he says, oh, you of little faith, he's not saying that they actually, you know, faith is not like a gas tank that you fill up. You know, you have a certain amount of faith. But faith is, is more, the opposite would be, oh, you of little faith means, oh, you of living by sight too much. Of living consumed by earthly cares too much and only thinking about this life and what's right in front of you. And so that's why Jesus goes on to say, do you not yet perceive? Do you not yet see beyond the circumstances and see that I'm speaking of something more spiritual, something beyond? Now, he wants his disciples to remember, as he goes on to say, do you not remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you gathered or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets you gathered? And so Jesus wants his disciples to remember, A, he can provide on command. And they still don't get it. That if they didn't have any bread, Jesus could provide on command. He can miraculously uh, transform whatever is in front of him into bread. And they're also forgetting what he wants them to remember in just stoking the memory of these grand, miraculous feasts, is that that's Jesus' heart, to provide lavishly. And, and we know, in hindsight, that these two miraculous feedings are foreshadows of the great cosmic marriage supper of the Lamb, a great feast that the church will be invited to at the beginning of eternity. And that Jesus, he, he really provides the ultimate an alternate and legitimate narrative. See, Jesus wants them to see their hunger, their story, their situation through the story of Jesus. Not just to interpret their lack uh, in a clean manner and just to focus on that. Charles Spurgeon, he says it beautifully in one of his sermons, Faith in Life. Let a Christian be much disturbed in mind. Let earthly cares get into his soul. Let him have doubts and fears as to his eternal safety. Let him lose a sense of reconciliation to God. Let his adoption be but dimly before his eyes. And you will not see much of the divine life within him. The second point, remember, is beware of earthly cares. Wherever earthly cares, because if we get consumed by that, then it'll be hard to live by faith. We'll always be living by sight, just seeing earthly cares. The third warning then here is this. Beware of missing Christ's metaphors. One thing you got to know about Jesus is that he speaks in a lot of metaphors especially the Gospel of John, you go there, it's just, if you love metaphors, then just soak up the Gospel of John. But even here in Matthew, he speaks in a lot of metaphors, and that's what the disciples couldn't get. And so Jesus, jumping back to verse 4, says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for signs. See, the, another way to put it, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they wanted to... Uh, Seeing was believing, right? But for the Christ follower, it's meant to be the other way around. We're, we're meant to believe, and then we see. We're meant to have faith and see with eyes of faith. And so Jesus makes it clear again, because he said the exact same thing. He uh, just indicted them as an adulterous generation back in Matthew 12, and he says the same thing, that no sign will be given except the sign of Jonah. Now again, I throw up uh, on the screen, you can see on the bottom right corner, this picture of the mountain. And I hope this metaphor will stick with you. Um, I've been sharing this uh, metaphor for three weeks now. And if you're a mountain climber and you come to this vast mountain, this immovable grand mountain, 
You have to adjust to the mountain. The mountain doesn't adjust to you. You have to orient yourself around this mountain if you're going to traverse it. And similarly, God's word is that immovable, eternal foundation. And we need to adjust ourselves to God's word. And here, meaning pay attention to when Jesus repeats certain things. And that's why it's good, again, just to go through books patiently and ploddingly. And you pick up certain repeated themes. And here Jesus repeats again, the only thing I will give you, the only sign, if you really want a sign, is the sign of Jonah. Now that's one metaphor that uh, Jesus puts out there in today's passage. And then again, we see this second metaphor, leaven, yeast. Here he uses it negatively. I believe back in Matthew 13, and you can look it up on our website, John Ferguson gave a great message of Jesus using this positively. That the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, yeast. So again, Jesus repeating this whole notion of yeast, something small that can affect you know, the whole thing very drastically. And so Jesus repeats again. Why does he repeat this? You need to pay attention. And so first, we, we got to learn, I, you know, dare I say, part of being a Christian is understanding metaphors. If you want to understand who Jesus is and what it means to follow him, if you want to understand the Old Testament, oh my goodness, you need to understand metaphors. Because the Old Testament, by and large, is one giant object lesson, one metaphor, if you will, pointing to ultimate eternal realities, the temple and all the sacrifices and so forth. And so to understand a uh, simple definition here, metaphor, it, it takes real life objects and scenes to drive deeper meaning into the heart. That's the point of a, a good metaphor will do that. It'll take something that you're familiar with in creation and then it'll drive something deeper into your affections. Eugene Peterson puts it more beautifully. Uh, it says, metaphor uses the language of sense experience, what we see, touch, smell, hear, to lead us into the world of the unseen, faith, guilt, mind, God. And so, for example, John Calvin, one of his beautiful metaphors, he repeats a few times in his institutes, the world is the theater of God's glory, right? History in the world is where God's glory plays itself out. I'm going to rip you apart like a lion eating her prey. Another great theologian, Albert Chung, grade eight, recess, <laughs> touch football. <laughs> okay, that's what I said to my friend. I distinctly remember that I took touch football at recess very seriously. <laughs> David, Psalm 18. The Lord is my rock, my fortress. Jumping down to my shield the horn of my salvation. These are all pictures in creation, things that familiar objects and scenes. And something about the way David puts it, all of a sudden the security we find in God, it just goes deeper into the heart. So Jesus, he wants the disciples to understand this metaphor. I'm not speaking about literal bread. <laughs> Speaking about the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So if you're not familiar with baking and yeast, they're, they're, what you see in the spoon there, they're, they're, it's granular, it's tiny. And just that little bit can make the difference between, as you see in the picture on the right, with yeast, the bread will actually rise and become fluffy and soft and airy and just a delight to bite into. And no yeast, it'll be denser. Now, here's where I want to tie in the, 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 the title of the sermon. See, thoughts. Thoughts are like yeast. One small thought enters your entire worldview, and, or in the morning, you just hear one thought, and it can just set your whole day off for better or worse. Thought is like yeast. And, and so Jesus is saying, watch out for these thoughts that come from the Pharisees and Sadducees. So again, the Pharisees, if we're going to really immerse ourselves into Matthew's world, we need to understand again that 
they were politically more the right wing and they were zealous. They were, if we had to make any comparison, you know, the evangelical right in the United States would be kind of like the Pharisees. And even against uh, the Roman government, they're willing to become zealous. They're willing to take up action and associate themselves with uh, little bands of revolutionaries. Part and parcel with that, they were legalistic in their approach to God. And they were preoccupied with outer obedience. And, and they believed that they could earn their salvation from God by their works and their obedience. And so much so they developed their own set of traditions and rules on top of God's law. Now the Sadducees, it's neat how these uh, just patterns repeat themselves in history. And the Sadducees basically were much like how politically overall Canada is, just more left and liberal. And in fact, even liberal Christianity, if you will. Why? What's the similarity? They, they rejected most of their scripture, the Jewish scriptures, as God's revealed and authoritative word. They chucked out the supernatural. They didn't believe that there was resurrection. And so it's interesting and ironic that they were asking Jesus for a sign. And so it points to, you know, a sign from heaven. It points to more their ulterior motive to just bring down Jesus as a competing movement. And so again, as I said, they were politically more left-wing and they were willing easily to make compromises with the Roman government. There wasn't as much zealousness as the Pharisees to stay pure as a uh, nation of Israel. And what was part of them, just the, their characters, they, they were the wealthy as well. They were willing to make compromises to gain more wealth and to enjoy that wealth and the comforts of this life, earthly cares. So they're naturally more pragmatic. The ends justified the means. And so overall, they lived for the here and now. Now, why does Jesus want us to pay attention to these two polar opposites? Because through history, through time, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they basically represent the two consistent enemies of the gospel. If you think of Jesus in the center and the true way to get to God, this gospel of grace, this sign of Jonah that we'll unpack in a moment. On the two sides of Jesus are just competing enemies of the gospel. Legalism, basically trying to earn and work your way to right standing before God, which every other religion basically falls under. And even if you don't believe in God, you're just trying to be a good person, to do your part in society, to be the, the, the survivor of, you know, the fittest, the fittest and, and the survivor and, and outdoing everyone else. It, it's your work, your effort. And on the other side is just a complete rejection of God. Basically license. I can do whatever I want. I can live whatever way I want. Now, these were the, the two uh, thoughts, this, this thought, you know, this worldview that Jesus was saying, be careful. Be careful of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Because if you think like this, you will stray away from knowing God as he longs to be known through me, by grace, through faith. But certainly, to apply this to 2020, the world that we live in today, there are a lot of isms, if you will, like legalism. There's so many isms. There are all these other thoughts, too. On one hand, if you look at being a pastor, it's one of the toughest jobs in the world because day-to-day, uh, week-to-week, -to, -week, to -week, I'm trying to compete for your attention in whatever hour, 15 minutes of time, and whatever other little emails and I might send out or, or any chance I get to connect with uh, some of you in one. All of that little time relatively speaking, compared to all the other information and websites and podcasts and commercials and just whatever culture and values that you find yourself immersed in, the gospel is competing with all of that in your life. And certainly, uh, just a whole category of leaven, if you will, to use the metaphor, all these isms, 
And I, I like to say, it just came to me one day, you know what isms really are? They're, they're all these ideologies and thoughts that really speak to I supremely matter. Whatever my thought is, my outlook, ideology, that's what supremely matters. So again, we've already mentioned legalism, but beware of legalism. Your sincere effort supremely matters. You need to be rewarded. Beware of, on the other end, just to review it again, license. And if you want a fancier term, you can sound smarter, if that's your thing. Antinomianism, basically, just I don't need any law in my life. My present, and what basically the, at the root of it is my present happiness supremely matters. Canadians that are listening, beware of Canadian pluralism and relativism. Sure, there's a, a beauty to it. We're a mosaic. We're, it, it's, it's great that we're so multicultural. But, but one side effect is that my and your viewpoint supremely matter together, which doesn't make sense logically and we end up just saying okay you believe what you believe i respect that you respect me what i believe and and then for the christ follower it weakens our witness we, we become perhaps even afraid at times to make a bold statement about christ behind all that is individualism beware of individualism being true to myself supremely matters no, that's false. Being true to God and who he has said we are and who has created us to be is what supremely matters. I want to say this next one very carefully. Beware of capitalism. <laughs> we live in a capitalistic society, or part capitalistic, and there are many biblical and beautiful uh, values in capitalism done right. But when my financial wealth, my financial security at the expense of others in an oppressive manner, when that becomes supreme, we need to question it. And on the other end, just bring this up because it's popping up so much these days and just rearing its head in, in our life these days. Beware of Marxism because it's a sort of a hot topic that's talked about. Now, this is a very complex topic, and I don't mean in any way to be able to summarize it perfectly, but what you have to be aware of is when you want justice your way. And when you believe human government is your savior on this earth, when those things supremely matter. Okay? Now, we need to look to Jesus. Not only to beware, but to be aware of a greater beauty that is pulling us, that is drawing us toward heaven. And so we get to Jesus' metaphor of Jonah. For those who know the story, Jonah, a reluctant prophet, or perhaps don't know the story, quick recap, reluctant prophet, called by God to go to a people outside of the ethnic people of God and to preach the gospel, to preach grace and God's loving kindness. And Jesus says, the one sign you'll get is the sign of Jonah. Look for someone like Jonah. And so like and yet greater than Jonah, Jesus is the sign from heaven. Like and yet greater than Jonah, Jesus is the substitute. If you know the story, there was a raging sea and it calmed down when Jonah was thrown into the sea. We know for Jonah and his people, and in Jesus' mind, that sea represented the chaos and pit of hell itself. And Jesus is the substitute. Like and yet greater than Jonah, Jesus is the substitute thrown into the chaos of the sea. That calms the wrath of God. And like and yet greater than Jonah, Jesus resurrected from the chaos of the sea, just as Jonah was ejected from the whale's mouth. And there was a resurrection of sorts there. Perhaps even a literal resurrection. We don't know. But Jesus, in a greater manner, truly resurrected from hell itself to defeat sin and death. Now different, not just like and greater, but different and greater than Jonah. Jesus willingly reached and preached God's grace 
to all the world. And different and greater than Jonah, Jesus' substitutionary sacrifice, his substitute, it's eternally effective. Jonah himself couldn't save the people that he went to. Only Jesus could. And my favorite difference between Jesus and Jonah is that Jesus' aftertaste after his ministry was gladness. Whereas Jonah, he still had this bitter, resentful heart. Why are you sharing your love and kindness with these people who don't deserve it? And so I, I hope there's something going on in your heart. Lord, help me to beware of spiritual pitfalls, even as I am aware and guided by your lavish, substitutionary love for me in Christ. If you're able, uh, let's stand together and let's respond in song, or perhaps you want to just sit and pray and reflect. Uh, whatever it is, but let's respond, whether it's singing or prayer. So let's join our hearts together with whatever we do. Mm -hmm.